Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. Well, it's a great pleasure uh, and honour to be able to have a short conversation and uh, some elaboration of your work with Neil Turok. Um, thank you very much, Neil, for making the time. Um, when there might be all these emails waiting with other spam of a significant and interesting kind, which we'll come back to later. <laughs> anyway, tell me when and where you were born. I was born in Johannesburg in South Africa mm -hmm. in 1960, 1958, mm -hmm. and um, I uh, grew up in a family which was very political, mm -hmm. uh, always in trouble. Uh, police used to knock on our door and come and uh, raid my uh, parents' book and record collection looking for uh, I was short of records, materials. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and so my parents were both very involved with the African National Congress uh, and the resistance movement in South Africa. Mm. Uh, my father went to prison when I was uh, three years old uh, for three and a half years and my mother when I was about five for six months. Um, and so I, yeah, I grew up in an exciting mm. family environment. Mm. We left as refugees uh, in 1966. We were allowed to leave South Africa and we moved to Kenya and in Tanzania. Mm. Uh, had a wonderful childhood in Africa. Uh, got truly, well and truly bitten by the African bug. Mm. And, um, and then we came to Britain. And I, uh, you're you're I skimming over in two minutes, which usually takes me an hour. But <laughs> So I'm, I'm just going to take it over. Back sure, again. no problem. Um, tell me something about, uh, do you remember your grandparents, for instance? Yes, I remember my grandparents very well. Um, when I was uh, five years old, my mother went to prison for six months, mm. and I went to stay with my grandmother, who lived in Durban. Mm. Um, and she was a Christian scientist. Mm. Uh, she believed very strongly in the gospel as preached by Mary Baker Eddy mm. and she took me to Sunday school uh, which I loved. Um, I loved the Bible, I loved the stories, uh, the ceremony of it all um, and uh, by the time I came home after six months I was praying every night mm. by the side of my bed <laughs> uh, which my two older brothers found completely ridiculous. <laughs> and after about a week they'd broken me of the habit. <laughs> so you never looked back. <laughs> I've never looked back in that way. <laughs> mm. uh, but we used to have these funny debates uh, about uh, whether there was or wasn't a God. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> one of the sort of clincher arguments, I think, <laughs> when, when I was religious, um, my brothers were said to me, you know, okay, if there's a God, where is he? Mm. I said, oh, everyone knows that. God is everywhere. And so they said, uh, okay, if he's everywhere, why didn't he shout out? You know, I just punched him. And so my answer was, well, he's very brave. <laughs> <laughs> to which, <laughs> and so it went on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, perhaps I won't go along this line, but you could argue that all your work is directed to the question of who he is and where he is and if he exists and so on. But you could. <laughs> <laughs> you could, but it wouldn't be true. I'll <laughs> let, leave that to my philosopher friend here, uh, Tina. But um, what was the occupation of your uh, family, so to speak? Your parents were not only political, but did they do something other? Yes, my father was trained as a land surveyor, mm -hmm. and so he had a engineering slash mathematical leaning. Mm -hmm. uh, he taught me Pythagoras' theorem, for mm -hmm. example, and how to make maps. Uh, I used to use his uh, hand-cranked calculator mm -hmm. to work out, uh, you know, calculations to very large numbers of decimal places. Mm -hmm. And um, he interested me in the ancient Greeks because he was a keen student of philosophy. Mm. Uh, when he 
So he was imprisoned in 1966. Uh, let me just get the dates right. Because that's when you, that's when you uh, no. emigrated in 66, you said. Yeah, no, we emigrated. <laughs> he was imprisoned in 61 mm -hmm. and uh, for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, while in prison, he had a lot of time on his hands. Mm -hmm. And so he studied uh, philosophy, uh, took a degree by correspondence and... Uh, the philosophers he sort of fell in love with were the ancient Greeks. Um, so he would often talk about them, and uh, the pre-Socratic pre philosophers essentially. People who had somehow suddenly seen <clears throat> the world with fresh eyes, had an incredibly clear perspective, uncluttered by tradition and uh, uh, mythology, um, and seemed to just really want to understand how the world worked. So he, he was a very uh, uh, strong influence on me and um, his passion for politics, uh, for freedom of black people in South Africa and for Africa generally uh, was, uh, was quite inspiring to me as a young person and it still is. What about your mother? What sort of person was she? My mother <coughs> was the carer mm. of the family. Um, she was left to look after three boys on her own uh, when my father went to prison when I was three years old. Um, and it was very difficult because she was a political activist herself. And so she was under constant harassment from the authorities. Uh, she was under uh, house arrest some of the time. Uh, her, own, her own family um, effectively disowned her because she had married my father and uh, they were very reluctant to support her and they kept telling her she ought to leave him and why wasn't she doing something sensible with her life and so on. So she's an incredibly brave uh, person and she survived the three and a half years with, uh, with us uh, during which she was imprisoned herself for six months. Um, and when my father finally got out of jail, she helped him to escape across the border uh, of South Africa. And she then uh, managed to get permission for her and ourselves to leave South Africa uh, on condition that we never returned. Um, and she brought us to Kenya, where we met up with our father again. So <coughs> my, my mother really, if you like, uh, was the backbone of the mm. family. Uh, she continued to play that role. And all through our childhood, I think, um, she was the one who supported us. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, in, in many ways. Uh, my, my father was always busy with a hundred schemes and, uh, and ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, it needs someone to actually care for the, for the kids. And, mm. uh, provide comfort hmm. <laughs> and not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, not just, um, how should I say, leading by example, hmm. <laughs> which is hmm. how, I, how I think he behaved. Hmm. Schools, um, you went to school first in Kenya, did you? Or? Um, no, I was in school in South Africa. Hmm. Um, we left South Africa. Uh, when I was seven, mm. and so um, uh, my first school was in South Africa. Uh, I was very precocious, mm. as far as I remember, mm. in school. I was uh, extremely naughty, mm. um, talked the whole time in class, um, but, uh, but was moved up a year because mm. uh, I got very quickly bored mm. with, uh, with what we were being taught. Um, and uh, so I'm sure I was an annoying uh, child <laughs> at school, mm. always looking for ways around the system mm. um, and uh, constantly breaking the rules. No, were you, at what age did you start to be really attracted to mathematics? A uh, very early age. Um, in fact, it was more physics than mm. mathematics. Mm. Uh, I, from the age of three, I would play with water. Um, mm pouring things, measuring things, weighing things, um, 
I loved uh, geometry um, at that time. I, I was fascinated with nature. Mm. I collected insects. Mm. Um, remember very vividly when it hailed mm. uh, in South Africa and collecting as much hail as I could in buckets. <laughs> and, uh, experimenting with it. And experimenting with it. I loved experiments and mm. chemistry um, and, uh, yeah, and animals. Mm. When you went on to the next school, um, which was what, at eight or nine? At uh, yeah, seven mm. we moved mm. to Kenya mm. and uh, I was there for uh, six months in a school in Nairobi. Mm. I don't remember very much of that school. We weren't really there mm. for long enough. Uh, what I do remember is that my father worked in the um, in the in the Ministry of Lands or, or whatever it was called, where, the the ministry which made maps. Mm. And I remember going to his work and mm. seeing how they converted aerial photographs into topographical maps. Mm. And I found that just fascinating, that you mm. could stare, you see it worked with these binoculars, that mm. you could stare at two maps, mm. so it gave you stereoscopic vision, and then you sort of scanned over the map and decided how high mm. the land was, and that was used to finally produce the um, topographical map. Mm. So uh, I found that very exciting mm. and interesting. Mm. Mm. Your I don't want to take too much of Tina's time, so I'm <laughs> going faster than I might. The real otherwise. school is in Tanzania. Ah, right. That was the real okay, school experience. Well, <laughs> tell, me, tell me the real school experience then. In Tanzania, I went to a, a fairly ordinary government school, but I had an absolutely exceptional teacher. Uh, she was a Scottish uh, volunteer teacher who had an identical twin sister, and uh, they're both teachers and their mother was a teacher, and they all three lived together <laughs> in the school. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so she was my maths and science teacher, mm. uh, Margaret. Margaret what? Margaret Carney. Mm. That's um, K? Or? C A R N I E. Yeah. And in fact, I'm still in touch with her. Mm. Uh, I called her up every few months. She lives mm. in Edinburgh now, mm. and she's in her 80s, but uh, she's an absolutely exceptional person. Um, as a teacher, she basically taught me that I could do whatever I wanted to do. And so she gave me books, she sent me outside, she said, uh, make a map of the school and a plan. Um, and so I taught myself trigonometry, um, made measurements, uh, made scale drawings of the school. Uh, then she gave me books about physics, I learned Archimedes' principle, and um, uh, pulleys and weights and forces, um, and we did a lot of projects. Um, and really, she didn't instruct me, uh, she simply pointed me in the right direction. Um, and she was just so, uh, you know, convinced that, that I could do things, um, and so supportive that uh, gave me an incredible start. Um, subsequent to that, I moved to England um, mm -hmm. and came to primary school um, in London. At what age? Uh, that was <laughs> uh, 10. Mm. At age 10, I came to uh, Muswell. So she was doing all this when you were about 8 and 9? 8 and 9. Gosh. So I came to, uh, uh, came to London and we lived in Crouch End in London. Um, my father was selling Encyclopedia Britannica because he, he, he couldn't get another job. And um, I went to primary school in Crouch End and they handed out these pages of um, calculations, long multiplication, division, addition, and I thought it was a joke. I thought, kids are actually doing this? Mm. You know, I did that four years ago. <laughs> Once you've learned the rules of how to multiply numbers, mm. you don't need to do a hundred examples. Mm. Um, uh, you know it and you mm. use it mm. for real problems. You don't do it mm. for its own sake. Mm. Uh, it just seemed utterly ridiculous. So I found the standard of schools in England. Mm. In spite of the fact we'd moved to England mm. to go to better school, <laughs> I found the standard way below mm. uh, what I'd had in Africa. 
Uh, of course, the same wasn't true when I, when I got to secondary school. Mm. Secondary schools in England were, of course, uh, much better mm. than they were in, in East Africa at that time. And um, I went to a very good school in, Where was that? in London. Uh, William Ellis, mm. uh, which was a grammar school. And, um, William Ellis. William Ellis. Yeah. It's a grammar school in Highgate mm -hmm. um, with some uh, outstanding uh, science teachers. Um, you know, it has uh, all the problems of grammar schools, I mm. think. Mm. Um, it's a, a kind of a grey environment, and um, uh, there's certainly many things to criticise. Uh, besides the fact, growing up in London, you know, is a lot less exciting than Africa. Yeah. Mm. So it was a bit of a shock for us moving to England, mm. the cold mm. climate, the cold people, right? darkness, <laughs> the grey people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, but certainly the schooling I had was, uh, was very good, and uh, I have no complaints about it. Mm. Were there any teachers there? Huh? Yes, there were. There were. I had a, a wonderful maths teacher um, who was an extremely modest um, but caring uh, person. Um, and even though I would say he, he wasn't, he wasn't by no means a show off. I mean, it's a very mm. common uh, feature, I think, of mathematics people mm. is they love to show off. Mm. <laughs> and teachers especially, and mm. show the kids how brilliant they are. He wasn't like that at all. He was actually very genuine and uh, wanted you to learn. And he did love mathematics. He knew his own limitations. But he sort of made it clear to you that he hoped you could do more than he'd done uh, with his mathematics. A uh, very, very nice uh, person. I, I remember some features of him. I mean, for example, he um, <laughs> at that time it wasn't the fashion to show your underpants above mm. your trousers <laughs> as it is now. Mm. But he did, <laughs> you know, not not deliberately. Mm. Um, and so, you know, some of the kids found that rather mm. funny. But uh, he was a very sweet mm. man. Do you remember his name? I don't remember mm. his name, unfortunately. Mm. Um, Probably could if I Were tried. you ahead of your age group by that time? Yes, I was. So I went to primary school in Crouchend, mm. and I was one. Uh, they put me down a year, mm. um, so I was in the correct age. Mm. Um, but it became. But then I took the entrance exam to the mm. grammar school, and they accepted me mm. uh, a year early. Mm. Um, and, and and thank goodness for that, because. Uh, it would have bored me out of my skull to stay there for another year. Mm. So, uh, so yes, I was always a year ahead. Um, were there other things at school apart from you were you were now concentrating on physics and maths and things? Physics? Actually, not. I was concentrating on biology. Mm. Um, I loved uh, nature, as mm. I said, and so I collected beetles mm. uh, from when we were in Tanzania. I did mm. that, and I was very serious about it and I joined the British Entomological and Natural History Society and I, in fact I was elected a committee member uh, of the society when I was 13. Gosh. <laughs> and I used to go every two mm. weeks to South Audley Street mm. in Kensington and, uh, and uh, meet with the amateur collectors mm. who were almost all over 60. Mm. <laughs> Um, but they preserve this tradition, the sort of Victorian tradition of the animal collectors and classifiers, and they used to paint beautiful drawings of beetles and, mm. and so on. And I loved all that. I loved the classification. I still believe that, you know, there's more beauty in a single beetle than there is in all of humans, human works of art. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, there's no better way to appreciate nature than to see the incredible uh, mm. diversity and and uh, refinement of, uh, of, of natural organisms. Mm. So I thought I was going to do biology, and I, because I loved mathematics as well, I thought I was, would do mathematical biology. And in fact, that's what I came to Cambridge uh, mm. to do. Um, but after I was here for um, six months or so, uh, and taken courses in theoretical physics, um, it really grabbed my attention because um, it is the most powerful, um, simple, 
um, effective part of science that we know of. Uh, you can write down an, equa an equation in one line, and that equation de describes a million phenomena with incredible precision. And there's nothing really like that in biology. So um, I sort of switched over to physics as an undergraduate. Perhaps you can explain something to me. I, I didn't even do O-level chemistry or physics, so I know nothing about it. But I've been looking at the history of Cambridge University. And yes. I cannot understand <laughs> Dirac's equation. I can't see how you can write an equation which has becomes a gold mine both right. for other people and for yourself. Right. And it has properties which then illuminate things which you didn't have any idea of when you wrote it down. Yes. How how is that? Work? It's absolutely astonishing. But you see Dirac like everyone else, like Newton, Einstein, Maxwell, um, they were working on the basis of knowledge which had been previously discovered. Uh, Dirac wasn't working in a vacuum. Uh, he knew about relativity. Uh, he knew about uh, Schrodinger and Schrodinger's equation. And he knew these things were correct because they had already proven themselves in various ways. Um, and so Dirac said, well, I need an equation which satisfies both relativity and quantum theory, as uh, described by Schrodinger. Um, and so he now had a, basically a mathematical puzzle to work out an equation which was consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics. And there is only one equation to write down, like the one he did. And so... Uh, you know, he was just a lucky guy who happened to <laughs> be in the right place at the right time mm. um, with the right mathematical tools. Uh, Dirac had an extraordinary mathematical mind. He had no, as far as I know, very little formal training in mathematics. He was trained as an engineer. Like Faraday. Mm. Mm. But, uh, and he never liked mathematics for its own sake. Um, he just invented it as he went mm. along. Um, <laughs> um, but his equation now describes, of all the particles we know of in the world, his equation describes 90 of them, and the remaining 30 are described by, roughly speaking, by the theory invented by Maxwell and successor theories. Mm. But Dirac describes three quarters of the known world. <laughs> Um, and it's a, it really is a single equation which which can be taught in two or three lectures. So One day I'll come to your lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is moving on to Tina's work. So let's just finish off on the uh, autobiographical. You yeah. came to Cambridge. Was there anyone at Cambridge who uh, taught you or lectured yes. to you who really influenced you at that time? Yes, I think there was one thing which uh, influenced me very strongly coming to Cambridge and which I appreciated, which is that the course was completely unsystematic. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first lecture course we took was called Modern Physics. Mm. <laughs> and it was lectured by Tony Hewish. Oh, yes. And it involved uh, hand-waving quantum theory, radio astronomy, a little bit of relativity. The hand-waving is Hewish hand-waving. Hewish hand-waving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit about data and how you make sense of it. Mm. Um, no mathematical derivation in the course was more than two or three lines. But it gave you a glimpse of a lot of exciting science and ideas and so on. And uh, that was really very deeply influential. Um, and I think it was a model of its time. Um, uh, mostly when physics is taught at universities now, and certainly in the US, in the strongest uh, physics uh, universities in the US, it's taught in a very systematic way, um, where it takes you at least two years before you get to anything more. And I think that's a real big mistake. Um, because uh, you, you want to grab people as early as possible. Uh, once they're motivated, they'll learn much faster than, uh, than if they simply see that they have to plow through two years. So I think without that course, I may not have gone into physics hmm. at all. Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
Then at the end of the, we're, we're skipping very fast, but the end of that, did you go on at Cambridge to do a start a PhD or what? Did yes, you I when I finished at Cambridge, um, you know, I'd, I'd done very well here mm. and had a scholarship and and so on, but I was tired of it. Mm. Um, there were things about Cambridge I didn't like. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is an elitist institution, and I'm not against that mm -hmm. if it's elitism, if it's intellectual mm -hmm. elitism in the best sense. In other mm -hmm. words, if people are really interested in ideas and discussion and innovation and so on. But I'm afraid at Cambridge a lot of the elitism ends up about uh, having formal dinners, uh, students who come from perhaps middle class or lower middle class backgrounds end up wanting to pretend that they are, you know, almost uh, aristocrats. Mm. And it becomes uh, basically farcical. Mm. <laughs> and so I didn't like that. Which college were you at? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was at Churchill College, which mm. is a science, science college. college. Mm. Was um, Cockroft then? <coughs> Pardon? Was Cockroft Master Cockroft and then... Um, Tizard. Because he, ah oh yes. Tizard. Mm. Um, so I like the college, I like the tutors and so on, um, but I didn't like to see the students uh, getting more and more interested in, in sort of putting on airs and graces, mm. I would mm. say, which, mm. which didn't, mm. I, I just didn't fit in with. Mm. And so I decided not to stay here to do part three mathematics, mm. which was the standard thing to do mm. for a Cambridge person. Mm. So instead I went to Imperial College mm. and uh, I took their Masters in Theoretical Physics and then a PhD. Mm. Um, and, and that was very interesting, it was very difficult. Um, mm. Life in London is nowhere near as nice for a student mm. as life in Cambridge is. Mm. Um, and so that was quite a uh, a lonely time mm. to go to uh, a place like Imperial, in the middle of London, uh, tiny student digs, all the students go home in the evening mm. so there's no real mm. college life. And uh, plus you're working on a PhD which in theoretical physics mostly consists of banging your head against the wall mm. and you have no idea whether you have any talent, mm. <laughs> whether the problem you're working on makes any sense, mm. <laughs> uh, whether there's any future in this. Um, and so I spent two years like mm. that mm. in London uh, without a clear idea of what I was doing. Um, in fact, the first year I spent, I worked extremely hard on the problem which I discovered after one year was not an interesting problem. Mm. <laughs> um, um, but uh, you, learn, you learn through this process. Mm. But it's not an easy route. Mm. And I would advise anyone thinking about pursuing theoretical physics to be very careful uh, that you are really willing to put up with some very hard times. Uh, it's not um, a, a subject where you get a quick reward. Mm. Uh, mostly it's uh, extremely frustrating and difficult. Mm. <laughs> So what did you, your parents were in London, weren't they? But you yes. didn't live with them, you lived in Diggs? No, I lived in Diggs. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> my father worked for the Open University. Mm. Um, and he was very, uh, you know, work-centred, I would say, very committed to his work. Uh, I used to see them regularly, he used to come mm. up for weekends. Uh, my mother would cook, cook, cook a nice meal for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, they lived in Watford. Mm. Um, and uh, yes, after I'd been there for, in fact, while I was in Cambridge, they moved to Zambia. Mm. So uh, they essentially went around for long, mm. long periods. And then after that, after the PhD, you? After PhD, I went to Santa Barbara. Mm. Um, I was lucky enough to find a mistake in the paper by a... Uh, <laughs> very famous good, scientist <laughs> who later won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> who was this? Uh, it's Frank Wilczek. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so I found a mistake uh, when I was a graduate student and he came to visit uh, Imperial or 
I saw him at a conference. He came to England for a conference, mm. and I saw him, and he graciously uh, accepted, um, mm. and withdrew the paper. And so I wrote a paper with my advisor on, mm. on that problem. And then I got a postdoc at mm. the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, mm. which is probably the leading such institute in the world. Mm. Um, fantastic place, uh, mm. interdisciplinary. I think they had three permanent faculty when I went there, and about 25 postdocs. Mm. <laughs> so basically we didn't interact with the faculty very much. Mm. Uh, they more set the tone and the quality, but it was just left to us to uh, to find other postdocs mm. to work with. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, I worked in many different fields um, and sort of uh, looked around to, to find a niche for myself, mm -hmm. uh, which, which was good. Mm. Uh, there are actually very few places like that today, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even that institute today has a staff, academic staff of more like 10 or 12, uh, and far fewer uh, and fewer postdocs. Um, so the, the balance has mm. sort of shifted. Mm. Um, but what was, what was very nice about it, it was a new institute. Um, and uh, just with a sort of very freewheeling atmosphere. And they said, all we're going to do is to try to gather the brightest postdocs in physics from around the world and we'll see what they do. And, mm. uh, and that's what you should do. <laughs> Uh, and every single one of those postdocs I was with in Santa Barbara now has an excellent position in uh, theoretical physics. I mean, it, it's astonishing, the success rate. And yet there was no um, planned mentoring or, um, you know, supervision of mm. the postdocs. It was interesting. Mm. I'm thinking maybe this is the point where we could and over to Tina, okay. because we're just getting on the edge of your work and life and so on. Is that okay with you? That's okay with me. That's okay. fine with you. <laughs> okay. So I'll sit <coughs> like this and you just talk to Tina. This will be fine. You, by the way, you might, I mean, this teacher that I mentioned, yeah. um, I lost contact with her after mm. Tanzania. Uh, and then I came to Cambridge in 19... Um, this is the one in Edinburgh. Seven, the one in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So I'd lost contact with her after the age of 10 mm -hmm. when we left Tanzania. Um, and then I came to Cambridge and I appeared on a uh, couple of years after being here. I did some work with Stephen Hawking mm -hmm. and I was on a TV uh, documentary program, which she saw. And uh, so she wrote me a letter and she said, are you the same? <laughs> <laughs> Neil Chirac, who I knew when you were 10 years old. Uh, and of course I was uh, just jumping up and down. I couldn't believe that I'd found her again. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to see her in Edinburgh and she was the same same person she always was. Um, so I've stayed in touch with her ever mm. since. I was wondering how that happened. I mean, that happened with my history teacher, okay. who I lost contact with for 25 years. And then I wrote a book and he wrote to me saying, Fantastic. I know. <laughs> I enjoyed your book and uh, I've kept in touch right. and see him a lot. And I still have the same mixture of reverence and terror of him. I mean, <laughs> I, I send him everything I write and you know, right. I really pay attention to his comments. His comments. Mm. Well, she had a very perceptive comment mm. when I, you know, this is the age of 80. Mm. I went to see him in Edinburgh and she's by no means sophisticated mm. scientifically. I mean, she mm. taught primary school and mm. science. But I, I started to tell her what I worked on. Mm. And she sort of interrupted me. She says, look, she says, I'm not going to, you know, this is not really what interests me. She said, there's only one important question. And I've asked it to every speaker I've ever seen talking about cosmology or astronomy. And the question is, what banged Okay. <laughs> you keep talking about the big bang and it, it, Scottish strong Scottish accent. What banged? <laughs> <I mean, laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so 
coincidentally, it was what I was working on. Mm. Um, but I've, I've subsequently used that as the mm. title of uh, talks that I give, and mm. I was attributed to her. Mm. And indeed, it is the most important question. What banged? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so Tina. So maybe we can start with this most important question, what bank? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, my questions will mainly um, use the material that uh, you um, present in uh, your book, Endless Universe. And uh, maybe to begin with, if you can just summarize very briefly uh, right. what the cyclic model hypothesis is about. So the original motivation for the cyclic uh, hypothesis or cyclic universe picture uh, came from a theory called string theory mm -hmm. uh, and a development of it called M-theory. <coughs> now these are our best current attempts to unify all the laws of physics into a single mathematical framework which is consistent uh, both mathematically and logically and also consistent with everything we know about the world. Um, and so a lot of progress has been made in string theory there does seem to be a, um, a, <clears throat> a single mathematical framework within which all the laws of physics fit. So Einstein's theory of gravity, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, Dirac's theory of particles, uh, these all fit together in a single framework, now called M-theory. <clears throat> and uh, other people had developed this. I wasn't responsible for this at all. But uh, to me, the... Uh, application of M theory and, and in fact the test of it the true test of the theory would be to see whether it could describe cosmology could it describe the universe so um, we developed the uh, so, so in fact the origin of the cyclic picture goes back to a workshop in 99 where we invited the leading uh, researchers working on M theory and leading cosmologists together just to see if anything Interesting. Could this come was out. in Cambridge, at the in Newton Cambridge, Institute. At the Isaac Newton mm -hmm. Institute. And uh, um, <clears throat> we had several lectures, and during one of these lectures, uh, me and Paul Steinhardt, uh, who's my longtime collaborator from Princeton, uh, but we'd, we'd never worked together at that point, uh, we both had the same idea that, uh, and it's a very simple and physical idea, that within M theory, there are these objects called brains. Um, and brain is shorthand for membrane. Uh, but you can have a one-dimensional brain, which is a string, or a two-dimensional brain, which is a membrane or a surface, like a soap bubble. A three-dimensional brain, which is space, three-dimensional space we live in, or four-dimensional brain, and so on, up to ten dimensions. The so theory says that brains of up to ten dimensions can exist. And uh, the world, if, if we want to picture it that way, consists of a ten-dimensional brain with other brains of lower dimensions embedded inside it. Um, and the intriguing thing is that you can't do this in an arbitrary way. That uh, once you've decided you want a theory of ten dimensions, you have to have all the other brains of different dimensions within it, and the rules whereby they interact are unique. Um, so there's no adjust, adjustment possible in the theory. So that makes it very attractive. Um, but up until our workshop, nobody had seriously tried to apply this to cosmology. Uh, at our workshop, we were fascinated with the particular picture which has, had emerged that the way to get from 10-dimensional M-theory to the real world was to get rid of seven of the dimensions by curling six of them up in a little ball so at every point of this room, you should really imagine that if I, if I only had a microscope, a really powerful one, I could look very closely at each point of space and I would actually see an extra little ball of six dimensions. It's a bit like a carpet where if I look at a distance, I just see the floor, but if I, a surface, but if I look closer, I'll see a little a weave um, uh, in, 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 the, in the carpet itself. So, uh, every point of three dimensions will be another six curled up. And I'll come back to that because that's, uh, even though it's at first sounds uh, shocking and uh, um, 
it sort of it sounds like you're uh, hiding a multitude of sins in these unobserved <laughs> Brushing under the carpet, so to speak. Brushing them into the carpet, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very uh, beautiful idea uh, when you look at it more closely. Um, but most intriguing to us was that there was a seventh dimension, which was even more bizarre. Uh, the seventh dimension is a gap. And it's a gap between two objects, which are three-dimensional brains. Um, and these, so, so you have a picture of the world that there is a three-dimensional brain we live in, our world and our particles we're made of travel around on this brain. Light travels in this brain. But uh, just next door to it, there's another brain. And these two brains are called end-of-the-world brains, meaning that they're the end of the seventh dimension. Uh, that there is nothing beyond them, they're almost like mirrors. And so the world really is the sandwich with nothing outside it of the, sev the seventh dimension of space in between the two three-dimensional brains we live in. And in every point of those three-dimensional brains there's another six dimensions curled up. So our thought was, what happens if these two uh, three-dimensional brains collide? What does that look like? Um, must be a pretty violent event because the whole seventh dimension disappears for a moment. But on the other hand, the three-dimensional brains we live on do not shrink to a point when they collide. They simply move together. Um, and therefore, it can't be like the Big Bang because, as we knew, the Big Bang is an event where all of space was at a point. That's the conventional picture of the Big Bang that came out of Einstein's theory. And so we could see immediately that here was another possibility for a bang, um, which is that the space we live in did not shrink to a point. All that happened is a collision between another world and ours. Uh, and when we worked through, so subsequent to that, we worked through the mathematics of this, and we discovered that this event of the brain collisions indeed appears, if you try to describe the setup using Einstein's theory of gravity, it appears just like the Big Bang. It is the Big Bang, for all intents and purposes. Just that in Einstein's theory, there is not a complete uh, description of this, uh, these brains colliding. And when you add that element in, you find that indeed space does not shrink to a point at the bang. Uh, space is extended. And so now you have the possibility of a physical mechanism which caused the Big Bang, which is describable. See, if the whole universe came out of a point, that would not be mathematically describable. I mean, a single point, we don't know how to describe its structure or anything interesting <laughs> happening. What we use in, in physics is always, they're called differential equations. We difference neighboring points. If you've only got one point, you can't write a differential equation down, and so you're, you're, you're lost from the beginning. But if you had a picture of the Big Bang that, no, in fact, it was an extended uh, bang uh, across space, now you have the possibility of describing a physical mechanism which can cause the bang. And, uh, and that's really where the cyclic picture emerged. So we were trying to understand how to describe the Big Bang singularity, what we realized is it could be the collision between two of these brains. And that meant there was time before the Big Bang. But of course, if these two brains can collide once, then they can collide again. And uh, quite quickly, after we'd invented the initial model, called the ekpyrotic model. Uh, ekpyrotic means out of fire. Um, and the uh, ancient Greeks had this picture of cosmology. Uh, that somehow the universe began in a, uh, in a conflagration. And so this was how to say, we call this picture of the colliding brains an ekpyrotic uh, model in homage to the, to the Greeks. And, uh, and, and then when we realized it could happen many times uh, and maybe uh, indefinitely many times, uh, we called it the cyclic model. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was a bit long, I'm afraid. No, no, <laughs> no that was wonderful. Okay. Um, 
this fourth dimension is yes. really intriguing. Yes. Um, while reading about cyclic universe, many many reader, readers that might uh, read about it unattentively would have thought about it as a breathing universe, yes. like expanding. Yes, and, that's right. Um, but uh, you say that uh, the three dimensions expand yes. constantly, that's so right. the only thing that shrinks that's is right. that spring-like force. Uh, exactly. between the brains in the fourth dimension That's and right. um, it's essentially like a pump I <laughs> think this is pumping uh, mm -hmm. in this direction but the universe is expanding in the, in the other directions mm -hmm. and uh, this gap is really small is 10 on minus 30 if yes. I, if 10 to minus 30 meters yeah mm -hmm. But uh, um, is it possible to imagine where it is? Well, it is in this fourth dimension. Yes. You said it's in the yes. end of the world. So would yes. it be possible? Uh, how how can we imagine where this is? Is like is it yes. like everywhere or is yes, it it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so every point of our three dimensional world is just ten to the minus thirty meters away from a corresponding point in the neighboring world. Which is uh, which is the uh, if you like the mirror world, uh, sitting at the other end of the seventh dimension. So we're we're only just separated from it uh, by a absolutely an immeasurably small distance. Um, and it, it it's interesting to ask: Are there any other manifestations of this extra dimension? Um, in fact, the the origin of this seventh dimension and the way it was first understood was that in our world there's a peculiar asymmetry in nature. Uh, Left-handed objects are not the same as right-handed. Uh, when you have neutrinos, a certain kind of elementary particle that has a very tiny mass, um, neutrinos only come left-handed. Um, the only ones we've ever observed in experiments are left-handed. There are no right... Left-handed means that um, if it's traveling along in the direction of your thumb, it's spin goes in the direction of your fingers. So it, it spins like this. Uh, there are no light, le, right, no right-handed neutrinos. Uh, Anti-neutrinos are right-handed, but neutrinos are left-handed. And that's always been a puzzle. Why is nature asymmetrical? Well, within the, the reason this was invented, this two-brain picture was invented, is precisely so that the left-handed guys can be on our brain and the right-handed on the other brain. And then mathematically it all works out. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, but uh, you said atoms and light and those things exist just inside one brain and then in, in yes. the other also. In the other but brain there's other stuff. Yes, but right. uh, there is one thing that connects them and that, that is the force of gravity. Exactly. And uh, how does that look like? You mentioned that it might be the dark matter is the gravity of this other brain. The, the, the dark matter might be the matter on the other brain. Mm -hmm. uh, the matter on on the two brains interacts only through gravity. So the dark matter would be on the other brain, we'd be on this brain, and gravity would uh, run across the gap. So the way we understand gravity is that gravity is really the curving of space. Uh, that's what Einstein understood, is you can, uh, space is not a rigid substance, it can bend, and the bending of space is precisely the force of gravity. So the sun bends space, and that's what keeps the planets going around in circles around the sun. Um, and in this M-theory picture, it's really uh, what I call Einstein++. Plus plus. You know, <laughs> in computer languages, there are various languages like C, and then there's C+, plus and C++. Plus plus. Well, M-theory is just Einstein++, plus plus because it says that there's not just the three dimensions, there are actually ten. Then there are all these other objects of different dimension, but each of them behaves exactly in the manner Einstein envisaged. envisaged. So they're all flexible objects, they, um, they can deform in various ways, and that is gravity. So you have these two brains here, uh, matter moving on this brain deforms the space in between the brains, and that's how gravity is transmitted across the gap to the other. And, and that's how the dark matter influences us. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a neat picture because the, it does naturally give dark, dark matter, predicts there should be dark matter, um, and it predicts that that dark matter should be visible only through gravity. Uh, and that's exactly what we see. You know, we see a galaxy uh, with stars running around, there seems to be some dark matter there, but we can't see the dark matter with light because it doesn't interact with light. Light only moves on our brain. 
Uh, the unfortunate thing about this picture, if it's true, is that it's really hard to test because since our only way of interacting with the dark matter is through gravity, we can't make dark matter a little larger. Uh, that, that's just way beyond current, uh, the energies we can get in current laboratories. So, <clears throat> in a sense, it's an unpleasant <laughs> uh, situation. I mean, you, you have this marvelous theory, but we don't yet know how to test it. And so all the more reason for, uh, I believe, that we should focus on the Big Bang. Because we know the Big Bang happened, we can measure the outcome of the Big Bang uh, in many ways, uh, and we can use that in order to check whether this theory is, is right. Mm -hmm. how, how can we check it? How can that be checked? You mentioned yes. gravitational waves in your book. Yes, I mean, there's, there's surprisingly a remarkably direct way of checking this picture, that the Big Bang was a brain collision. Mm -hmm. um, and that's using gravitational waves. So the <coughs> gravitational waves are ripples in space, which travel at the speed of light. Um, we have never detected them directly, because they interact very weakly with matter. Um, and so it, 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 even though we believe the universe is full of them, we haven't been able to, to measure them yet. They will be measured within the next 10 years. There are a lot of experiments now, um, uh, <clears throat> very precise experiments, which are going for gravitational waves, and we are 100% sure they will be me measured in the next 10 years. When they are, this will be a new window on the universe, because we will see black holes colliding, uh, all kinds of violent phenomena, which emit gravitational waves, we'll just be able to see them directly. Because gravitational waves interact so weakly with matter, uh, that's a wonderful thing from the point of view of seeing the Big Bang. Because it's just like uh, the, the, the universe is transparent to gravitational waves. Um, so when we look out at the sky now, we see the radiation from the Big Bang, the microwave radiation. And that shows us the universe as it was <coughs> Uh, 13.7 billion years ago, but about 300,000 years after the bang. Because only then had the universe become transparent to light. Before that time it was very dense, very hot, plasma, which is opaque to light. So using light we can never look back to uh, earlier than 300,000 years after the bang. But gravitational waves take us right back to the bang itself. So these waves emitted at the bang would just travel straight through the plasma without any interference um, and straight into our detectors. And so currently there are experiments being planned. There's something called LISA, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, what is it, the Large Interferometric Space Antenna, which is a set of three satellites which will be put in space in 2013 or so. And, uh, they will be looking for gravitational waves uh, coming out of the early universe. Um, now, the way in which you check this theory of the brain collisions, uh, first of all, is, is a, 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 a negative check. Um, let's, so so we, we have to discuss a little bit the alternative theory. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so the, the standard picture of the Big Bang uh, just accepts that the universe emerged from a point without any explanation. It just says, well, that's something we can't describe. Let's just assume the universe sprang into existence <laughs> okay, at some point in time. What state would it have had to be in in order to end up like it is today? And the answer to that question has, it is initially very, very puzzling. Because if you have a tiny universe, um, springing into existence. How did it get so big and smooth and uniform in all directions um, as we see it today? And that was just seen as a paradox uh, for a long time. Uh, in particular, you can say, if I look in this direction on the sky, I see one, I see a, a certain temperature of the microwave radiation, a certain number of galaxies, and so on. Look in the opposite direction. You see roughly the same thing. How do they know about each other? Um, at the bang, 
uh, 14 billion years ago because the light from them is only just you know, reaching me. So they certainly can't have known about each other. There's no way to communicate. So puzzles like this um, led to what's called the standard picture of cosmology. And according to the standard picture, you simply assume the universe jumped into existence. And you assume that it was full of something called inflationary energy. And inflationary energy has the strange property that it makes space expand exponentially. Um, you can do this, you can add this energy into Einstein's theory of gravity. And it's a sort of repulsive form of energy which blows the universe up, makes it very smooth and uniform in all directions. But it's never really explained why the universe started out that way. So that's the standard point of view. Now, to come to gravitational waves, um, this uh, epoch of inflation has a very dramatic side effect, which is when you make the universe blow up exponentially, um, it's such a violent process that you generate lots of waves. It's almost like hitting a bell or an explosion of some sort. Uh, the ripples in space-time, which are just there, present in the vacuum, uh, even in empty space, uh, when the universe starts to blow up exponentially, and it, and it blows up by a huge factor, e to the 10 to the 100, it, it, it is what typically happens in this inflationary theory. This enormous blow-up, spews out gravitational waves. Uh, it takes these quantum vibrations in the vacuum, turns them into real big long wavelength vibrations of space. And we should be able to measure those. So, uh, so, so that's what inflation predicts gravitational waves. Uh, the cyclic model is much gentler. You have these two objects, they drift together over periods of billions or, or even longer, uh, trillions of years before they collide. When they collide, all of space isn't at a point. It's all spread out. It's simply that this collision has filled space with radiation. And then it subsequently expands. So it's a much gentler process, and you don't get the gravitational waves uh, that you would get with inflation. So if these gravitational waves are seen, they will instantly disprove our model. Uh, so it's, it makes it testable and exciting. <laughs> uh, next year, a so even though the direct detection of gravitational waves will only be possible in about 2013, the, um, uh, the there may there should there may still be a detection before then. Mm -hmm. uh, next year, something called the Planck satellite mm -hmm. will fly, and they have a means of detecting gravitational waves indirectly through their effect on the microwave radiation coming from the early universe. Uh, so Stephen Hawking bet me, when we mm -hmm. first came up with our model, uh, I gave a talk about it here in Cambridge, and Stephen always likes a, uh, a bet, and <laughs> so he said, I bet you the gravitational waves will be detected by Planck, and your model will be pro proved wrong. And so I said, I'll accept your bet for any amount of money you care to name, <laughs> at even odds <laughs> and uh, so far he, he's refused to name an amount of money because he doesn't want to bankrupt me <laughs> but uh, he has promised me that we will decide on uh, something mm -hmm. uh, for the bet uh, the other idea I had is that he plans to go into space in I think three or four years from now um, Richard Branson has offered to take him in space on Virgin Galactic. And uh, so I said, well, let's, let's say that if I'm right, I go into space. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't accept that one. <laughs> so so we're sort of, we are living on the edge. Mm -hmm. It could be that next year our model will be dead. And uh, to me, that's exciting. Um, I have worked on theories before which have been proven wrong. And even though it's disappointing and, you know, you prefer them to be proven right, um, I, I think it's good science. And I, I think, uh, you know, one should be humble in the face of the universe. Uh, the best we can do is try to make the most complete and consistent models that we can. 
and then we have to test them as, as, uh, as ruthlessly as we can <laughs> to, in order to prove them wrong. And if they are proved wrong, we should say, yes, that's progress. I mean, at least we, we now know, you know that avenue is ruled out. Mm -hmm. um, so so I'm, I'm perfectly willing to... Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm only really interested in theories which can be proven wrong. I mm -hmm. would say it that way. <laughs>
matters in the universe today, otherwise we wouldn't have seen it. So it's very important for the future of the universe um, because it causes it to expand faster. So whereas matter makes the universe slow down its expansion, this stuff speeds it up. So if we now follow, so we're currently 13.7 billion years old, if we uh, follow another 13.7 billion years in the future, this stuff will really have taken hold and it will, be, will have begun to dilute away the galaxies exponentially. And we need to wait a few more tens of billions of years, all the galaxies we see now, almost all of them, will disappear from view. They're just diluted away. Uh, we'll actually just see them go redder and redder as they're accelerated away from us and they'll disappear. So we will be alone in an empty universe, surrounded perhaps by our nearest neighbor galaxies, but nothing else. And so people in the future, or scientists in the future, will be very puzzled by the universe. They'll find themselves in an apparently empty universe. They won't see the radiation left over from the Big Bang, because it will have been diluted away. Um, uh, and it will look very different than our universe today. So, uh, faced with this situation of a universe which started from a Big Bang, which was indescribable, which ended up dominated by dark energy, which is mysterious, uh, we thought we would try to see things from a different point of view. And uh, that's how the cyclic model arose. So we had this picture that the bang could be a collision between brains. The brains would separate and possibly they would come back and come out again. Now the question is how does dark energy fit into that picture? And what we discovered was something uh, rather simple, which is that when the brains separate, if they, if they do have some dark energy, that causes them to expand in this dimension and stretch out and become very flat and very parallel to each other. Um, and then this dark energy can actually decay. Uh, in fact, the dark energy can be the source of the force which brings them together. And as the dark energy decays, they will run together and collide again and make another big bang. And so what, what the dark energy does is it makes the universe um, empty, smooth, vacuous, and ready for another Big Bang, which will produce another universe, which is very big and very smooth, uh, will be emptied out again by the dark energy. So in fact, the dark energy is like a stabilizer. Uh, if, you, if you didn't have any dark energy, these brains would collide, their wrinkles and deformations they acquired in one cycle of evolution would be magnified the next time and the whole universe would become more and more contorted and violent and disorganized. The dark energy keeps it all organized and uh, basically also provides the power which ends up uh, causing the brains to collide and smooths them out afterwards. So it, does, it performs many functions within the model. Without dark energy, our model doesn't work. So, uh, whereas in the conventional picture of cosmology, dark energy is not necessary, it's just an afterthought. You know, it's something we have to add to fit the data. Uh, it doesn't play any kind of determining role in the model. In our model, the whole model doesn't work without dark energy. Um, so, uh, that, that's interesting. And then finally there's this big puzzle, why is it so small? Uh, now, I would say people working in the conventional framework have given up trying to answer this question. They say, we will never explain why, at the Big Bang, whatever produced the bang, somehow made the choice, I'm going to fill the universe with radiation, matter, huge densities and energies, and then I'll just add in 10 to the minus 20, 120 of dark energy. Okay, no one will ever understand that. Why did they do that? Why did, you know, why did the physics determine this value for the dark energy? So they've basically given up uh, explaining it, and instead they resort to something called the anthropic principle. Uh, anthropic principle says maybe all kinds of universes emerge or are created, but we're not there in most of them. 
And so if the dark energy was much greater in magnitude, it would have killed us or, or our uh, ancestors, and so we wouldn't be here. Uh, this is a kind of appealing argument in some ways, but when you look more closely, it doesn't actually have any predictive power at all. It's more a rationalization. It's more saying, well, this, uh, this problem is really one which we'll never understand. So I don't, I don't uh, find that explanation appealing. Um, in our case, if you have this picture of a very old universe, much older than 13.7 billion years, in previous epochs, the dark energy played a huge and even controlling influence. Then you have a huge amount of time for this dark energy to uh, relax. It, 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 its values can change, and, and in these theories, like M-theory, everything can change. All the laws of physics are actually dynamical. All the parameters can, can change. Then this dark energy can change over very long periods of time. And maybe what's happened is the dark energy has settled down to a value which is just right uh, to keep the universe uh, cycling in a stable fashion. So it's as if you have a, you know, an engine or a motor and you have a source of fuel and you switch it on and initially there's some transient period but it settles down at some value. And given that the universe is able to have long cycles, um, uh, it's, it's entirely conceivable that dark energy has settled. So we've published some papers on this idea. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a radical alternative to the standard view. But I think it, what we have shown is that technically we can construct mechanisms which, again, it's a sort of technical use of the word natural. Uh, it's a, it, we use it to mean when we don't have to dial parameters to ridiculous, ridiculous small values. We can make a model which will self-adjust the cosmological constant down to the small values like the ones we see today. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's only a model, it's not clearly true, but uh, I think what the dark energy has done is made us uh, really rethink uh, our concept of cosmology and the Big Bang. Uh, whereas people had seen the Big Bang as somehow, you know, a one-off intervention <laughs> which made a universe with everything we see. Now that picture doesn't seem to be coherent. Uh, why would the universe work out the way it has uh, if, it, if it was produced that way? You also write that no form of energy in the past or the future ever goes out of existence, yeah. and that when cosmologists study dark energy today, they are also studying the same type of energy that dominating during intervals in the distant past right. and that will dominate in the intervals in the far future. That's right. Could there be any um, information stored in the dark energy somehow yes. uh, about the past and the future yes. of the universe? Yes, definitely. So, uh, in the cyclic model, as the universe passes through one of these violent events, where it goes from being empty and full of dark energy, well, empty of matter but full of dark energy, uh, it goes to being full of matter and radiation. Um, what happens is that any signals or radio waves left over in the previous cycle do make it through. I mean, they, they will be there. Uh, you will need very, very sensitive detectors to, to read it. But in principle, it's all there. Nothing is ever lost. Um, and so, so that's, a, that's an exciting thought, that actually we could uh, possibly communicate um, our discoveries about science to the future, and future generations who live in future cycles could one day uh, receive it. Um, what actually happens near one of these events is that all the particles we're made of uh, as the brains collide, they lose their mass, which is to say they become massless and they all move at the speed of light. So the only entities in the world which are uh, present at the bang itself uh, are moving at the speed of light. Um, and so it would be a very unfamiliar world <laughs> uh, where all our particles, you know, we would be sort of, uh, we, we'd literally fall apart in a burst of radiation. And then immediately after the bang, we would be reconstituted into material uh, objects. 
Um, so it would be a very uh, dramatic and violent event, but there's nothing to stop radiation going through the bank. Mm -hmm. um, there is another interesting thing is your, in your theory, and this is a big crunch. Yes. Uh, is this big crunch just another name for the Big Bang? Are those yes. the same things? Same the thing. same. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a collision between these two brains. So maybe something more about the extra, extra dimensions. dimensions. <laughs> so according to our current understanding of uh, the laws of fundamental physics and, and our best uh, unified theories, uh, like. Uh, the laws of physics we see in three dimensions are largely determined by the size and shape of the extra dimensions. So at every point in this room, there's another six dimensions of space curled up in a little ball, a rather complicated little ball. It may have uh, holes and uh, uh, brains are wrapped around it and so on, but a rather complicated configuration which we can study. We know mathematically how, how to study. Um, and the detailed configuration of the extra dimensions actually fixes the physical laws we see. So electromagnetism, the strong force, the weak force, the different spectrum of particles we see, that is fixed by the configuration of the extra dimensions. So at one level, we haven't solved these problems in physics. We haven't said, yes, I know why there are three colors of quarks, or why electrons come with neutrinos, or we haven't really understood those problems, we've just converted it to another problem, <laughs> which is why are the extra dimensions the way they are? Um, but that's progress, because you've taken an apparently insoluble problem and you've converted it into another problem, which may or may not be solvable. But from my point of view, what makes it interesting is that we've learned from this framework that not only do the laws of physics govern the universe, there are simple general laws to govern the universe, but the universe governs the laws. In other words, the configuration of the universe determines what the laws are which govern the universe. So it's all very self-referential. <laughs> and more to the point, if we understand cosmology, see cosmology is the study of the structure of the universe, well, we better include those six other dimensions. And if we understand their structure and why they assume the structure they did, then actually we've understood all of physics. So all of physics is determined by the structure of the universe. Then you say, well, where did all that come from? Where, when was this structure uh, determined? Uh, what physical processes? Well, of course, it came out of the bank. Mm -hmm. And so when this bang happens, you, you should not only study the gap between the brains which cause them to collide, but the other six dimensions are doing something in this process at the same time, and it better be mathematically consistent. And maybe it involves changes in their configuration, they can change. Um, and, uh, and, and once you've understood the whole process of the Big Bang, maybe you will understand why the universe emerged, in, in, in the, not only in, with the structure it has, but also with the structure of the extra dimensions it has. And then you actually have understood all the physics. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing is how all these questions have in fact become one question. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, what banked? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you think we will ever find a final true answer to this question? And uh, uh, that you think that the uh, universe is actually a cosmos that can be expla explained rather than a chaos that cannot be explained according to I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there are limits to knowledge. Um, some people, I think in the last few years, have become rather pessimistic um, and they have resorted to this anthropic principle or other similar arguments to say, you know, this is the end of the road for physics. Essentially, some people do argue that. Uh, I don't know. Um, but I know that if we take that attitude, we'll get nowhere. <laughs> but you do state at, uh, in the book that this is the best time for a cosmologist of all times and that you are very thankful that you live at this exact moment. Why? Because the last 10 years have seen unimaginable amounts of data collected from the universe. I mean, I was a cosmologist in 92 uh, before the COBE satellite mapped the universe for the first time. And at that time I was seriously considering giving up because there was, every, most of the discussion was um, 
based on um, you know prejudice or th there wasn't any good data um, and so you had schools of thought and some people were making galaxies this way and other people that way and there wasn't any clear-cut data to to discriminate between the theories. Ninety-two, the satellite went up and mapped the universe and uh, suddenly gave us a clean picture of the Big Bang. It was just phenomenal. Um, and ever since then, the last ten years, we've had this stream of high-quality data and we now have the prospect of measurements of gravitational waves uh, looking right back to the Bang. Um, it's a, it's a unique period in human history where not only are we speculating about the origin of the world, but we actually have the data to, to test these theories. So I think to be pessimistic now is, is really ridiculous. I mean, people have been waiting for at least two millennia <laughs> to answer these questions, you know, and probably hundreds of millennia to answer these questions. We have the data, you want to give up now? You must be mad! <laughs> um, um, uh, when the idea was born, uh, yeah. you wanted to discuss it right away, uh, but that particular night you were uh, going to see a play Copenhagen in yes. London, I yes. read, and um, what m made me thought of one thing, because the play Copenhagen is um, discussing uh, ethical problems of That's science, right. of Bohr and uh, uh, Heisenberg. Right. Um, are there any ethical uh, implications or any ethical pro problems uh, connected with the cyclic model? Could, could that somehow influence uh, also yes. the practical... Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, okay, so I'll give you an example of an eth what I consider to be an ethical problem. Um, the, according to the cyclic model, the basic, basic motivation of it is to try to understand uh, what happened at the bank um, and to make mathematical models. And, and so our statement, uh, our first statement is that it's interesting to try to make a consistent mathematical model of the Big Bang itself. Now some people don't even want to consider that. Uh, people say, no, this is beyond science. Uh, the start of the universe is is not something we should be looking into. Um, in fact, many ordinary people just say, look, you're getting into dangerous territory here. <laughs> <laughs> Explaining the Big Bang, that's religious uh, territory. And so first of all, I'd like to say that it is an ethical statement, in my view, to say no, a subject like this is legitimate science. Uh, not only can we do mathematics, we can do experimental tests, observations, um, and we should. And it's a wonderful and inspiring thing for people to think about. Uh, so I think, it, and I think it leads to a better appreciation of the universe. Even if you've got a model which is wrong, you're trying <laughs> to understand the world, and um, and in that process you appreciate it much better. Um, but the second thing is again relating to this pessimism. Uh, some people are uh, arguing, even within physics that um, uh, we've reached the end of the road and that um, there are some problems too hard for us to understand. And I think for me that's also an ethical question comes into the, it there. <laughs> because I think it's our ethical responsibility to keep going mm -hmm. <laughs> and to encourage young people uh, who may have better ideas than we do. Mm -hmm. And not to say um, uh, science, you know, has maybe reached the end of the road. And mm -hmm. so me, it's actually a very deep belief that if you like, um, even if science is going to be much more difficult from now on, um, it's something which we have, have to do. Mm -hmm. It's something which we cannot avoid, uh, which our, if you like, our children or, or future uh, young people will never forgive us for giving up mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so I, I feel very deeply about this that, um, uh, you know, I, th I guess people talk about the golden age of various subjects and people say maybe physics has had its golden age and the next one is biology and the next one is, you know, uh, maybe people should concentrate on engineering or something now. Um, 
And I feel very deeply that's not correct, because I think what we have learned from physics is that nature is remarkably simple once you see through uh, all the details. Um, and it's one of the treasures of humanity that we have this picture, uh, a very simple picture of, of, of nature. And I think if, if all we do is to uh, take care of that picture and appreciate it, and by trying to generalize it, we actually help people learn it. Mm. Um, and, and, and even if we ourselves don't succeed in taking the next step, at least we will have kept the whole subject alive mm -hmm. and, and interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I, I, I care very strongly about this, and I think the interest in this kind of pure science and pure thinking about the universe um, and honest thinking you know, we, we have to be humble. We're making models. They're probably wrong. <laughs> we, should, we should take delight when we've proven them wrong and, and go forth with more energy and make better models. That activity, I think, is something which is common to all of humanity. Uh, when I meet uh, students from Ethiopia or Madagascar or wherever, they are all fascinated with these things. And whatever culture people come from, they share it. So I regard physics as, a, as being very uh, lucky to, to have this tradition and uh, this set of knowledge which needs to be cultivated and worked on. And if the next leap takes 10,000 years, fine, uh, mm -hmm. we'll wait, because it will be worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, do you see any possible uh, negative consequences, like could that knowledge that uh, if scientific yes. model yes. proves to be right, yes. would that knowledge be uh, somehow, um, is it possible to abuse it in some way? Would it be? Very likely. I think all knowledge can be abused. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it never comes with a stamp mm -hmm. saying, <laughs> mm -hmm. safe, <laughs> safe knowledge. Um, there is no such thing as safe knowledge, I don't think, um, and it's up to people to, to use it wisely. So I don't, I don't think there are any intrinsic uh, ethics in science. Mm -hmm. I think ethics is something one has to add to science and, um, and try and use it sensibly. Having said that, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about any applications at the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's, it's rather you know, it's very far in the future mm -hmm. where people may be able to manipulate uh, things of these energies. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, the laboratory energies we can reach are about 10 to the power 15 times too small to probe any of the physics of the bang itself. Mm -hmm. If we could build an accelerator that was 10 to the power 15 more, time, more powerful, then we could actually do this in the lab. Mm -hmm. That's a long way off. Mm -hmm. uh, I think probably uh, our descendants will figure out how to do it one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's nothing that pro prohibits it, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'm not too worried about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So maybe now we can proceed with African Institute? Well, that, that, well there'll be two things. One, that's just finishing this theoretical bit. Um, yeah. You said that in the last two months you've been oh, yeah. developing some new ideas yes. which we will hold back on until you want us to let the world know. But what, what No, you... they're already on the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're going to try these out in various yes. places in America and elsewhere. Yes. What, what are these? Can you summarize these? Yes, I can. Uh, so probably the single greatest breakthrough of the last ten years has been the realization that gravity uh, is describable in a way uh, without using gravity. So, uh, as, I, as I explained earlier, gravity involves the deformation of space. It's the curving of space. And that's always been our picture since Einstein. Um, but in the late 90s, um, a, a young Argentinian physicist uh, called uh, Juan Maldacena made a conjecture which is uh, extremely interesting and exciting and for which there's now a huge amount of evidence that it's correct. The conjecture was that um, in certain situations you can take a chunk of space 
which is dynamical, so the space can warp and bend, uh, and that's gravity. You take this chunk of space, but the space is bounded by essentially a container. I mean, there's a boundary of space. And on that boundary, you have some matter moving uh, and interacting with itself. But the boundary itself is not dynamical. It can't change. There's no gravity on the boundary. It's literally like having, um, if you like, a rigid cylinder, but with rubber in, inside. So it's flexible inside, but rigid on the boundary. Now, his conjecture was that you could describe everything that happened in the interior purely in terms of what was on the boundary. Uh, it's, a, it's called a holographic principle. Holography, it, as you know, is when you map a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional picture. And that was his picture, that the interior would be mapped onto a, a rigid exterior, and then you could use uh, a description, you formulate a description of the world entirely in terms of what happened on the rigid boundary. Uh, and so this is very exciting, and it has been used to understand black holes, for example, when black holes evaporate and, uh, and release their energy, how that process occurs, and how the information trapped in black holes emerges when they evaporate. But uh, in the last few months, we've been using this to understand uh, cosmology. So what we do is we map a dynamical universe, uh, which is called the bulk, it's the interior, the sort of dynamical part of space-time. We map that onto a boundary, and we follow the system as it goes towards the Big Bang, or, or Big Crunch. So it heads to a singularity, and then we see what happens on the boundary, the singularity. And what we've shown is that on the boundary, you can describe exactly how the system goes through the singularity. Um, and once you've gone through, so essentially you take the bulk which has gravity in it, you map it onto this rigid boundary, you follow it till it hits a singularity, you follow it through the singularity, you come out on the other side and you map it back into the bulk, where it's again described by gravity. And so we've constructed the first uh, complete model of passage through a singularity. Um, and, uh, and it's very fascinating. Uh, not only, it appears, can the world go through a singularity and survive, uh, which is again, mm -hmm. and uh, this is another picture of the brain collision, in fact. The two things are related. So not only can that happen, but also in the process of heading towards the singularity, it turns out that variations in the density of the stuff on the boundary are, are created. And these variations in density from place to place are of exactly the form we need to explain the variations in density in the real universe. Uh, they're called scale invariant. Uh, and so the, the variations we see, which gave rise to galaxies, are, are known as scale invariant, meaning they're the same on all scales. And scale invariance is a very simple property. It's also a reflection of an underlying symmetry. And what happened is that Maldacena's picture, whereby gravity maps to matter in the bulk, in, on the boundary, that picture the boundary theory is automatically scale invariant. Um, and so that scale invariance of the theory translates into the scale invariance of the density variations. So we've, we've written a couple of papers about this, and uh, there, there are many aspects still to be completed in the picture, but we, we, we think we have uh, the, the means to do that. And um, we, if this is correct, if this picture turns out to be correct, it will be easily the most elegant explanation of the origin of the density variations, because it really all comes from symmetry principles, from gravity and from symmetry principles. Um, so this is very exciting, and I'm presenting this work at several talks in the near future, and we'll see what the response is. Lovely. I've got three more questions, if you can okay. bear it. Yeah. Uh, one is you've worked with a number of Cambridge um, cosmologists, and two, I'm particularly interested in, that is Martin Rees yes. and uh, Stephen Hawking. Yes. Martin talked about Stephen, who was right. just slightly older than him. Right. Um, how, how can you, as they say, compare and contrast those two 
Uh, they are mm. polar opposites. Mm. Um, Martin's great strength is in uh, keeping abreast of the latest observational discoveries and the latest facts uh, about the universe and trying to piece together, trying to piece them together in a coherent picture. And so Martin's contributions, I think, uh, to cosmology have, have all been what I would say on the phenomenological side. Mm. He looks at the phenomena and tries to make a sensible model of the phenomena. Uh, Stephen's contributions have been the opposite. Uh, Stephen has been interested in fundamental theory, meaning that he, from his point of view, mathematical consistency and elegance is primary. Um, it's, it's in the tradition of Einstein. Einstein essentially wasn't too worried about data. <laughs> you know one of his quotations? No. <laughs> uh, he said, if um, the data contradicts the theory, yeah, change, change the data. The data. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he probably didn't mean that literally. <laughs> but um, uh, Stephen has... Uh, Stephen's work is... Uh, all, has always tried to employ the most advanced mathematical techniques um, to address theoretical puzzles and problems, uh, paradoxes. So he would be much more interested in a sort of fundamental theoretical pa paradox than he would in the very latest observation. Um, having said that, uh, Stephen has huge respect for the observations and so and interest in them. Mm. And, and should they become definitive, you know, he might even believe them. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't really want to be, um, you know, it, 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 there's also a cultural difference between astrophysicists and theoretical physicists, uh, by which I mean people studying particle physics, general relativity, fundamental theory. Uh, the cultural difference is that astrophysicists are uh, usually very, very quick to jump on a new measurement. Uh, every week there's a new type of star or galaxy or something detected, and astrophysicists will immediately want to say, you know, imagine, you know, what is that? And is the cloud of gas falling in, or is some dark matter swelling? Mm -hmm. You know, exactly what's happening. Uh, theoretical physicists take a longer term uh, view of the world. It's not necessarily the right view. I mean, mm -hmm. discoveries can be made in a moment, mm -hmm. um, but there's just a different culture. Mm -hmm. That's and, uh, Martin and Stephen represent mm -hmm. those two cultures. That's very, very helpful. The second thing is, you, you talked earlier about your dissatisfaction with Cambridge, but, <laughs> but here you are, a professor of theoretical physics or whatever. Um, you're back. Is it a good place to work? Cambridge has been fantastic for me, uh, personally. Um, mainly because uh, two things. One is the wonderful collegiate atmosphere. Uh, I was working in Princeton before mm. I came here, uh, which is an excellent department, possibly the best physics department in the world. Um, and but much more, I would say, sort of aggressive and uh, self-promoting. Um, culture. What's, what's so enjoyable about it is that colleagues are um, very willing to spend time to discuss or to share ideas or their knowledge or their expertise without any agenda. I mean just for the sake, for the sake of it. And so that, that, it has that culture which is, which is excellent. Um, the second thing which is great about Cambridge is the flexibility of the institution, that providing you fulfill a certain number of basic duties, uh, which are pretty modest uh, compared to other universities, um, you can do what you want. Uh, so for example, in coming to Cambridge, uh, I had uh, freedom to set up an institute in Cape Town <laughs> and to raise money for it. Um, and to bring in all sorts of allies and partners. And I don't believe there would be any other university in the world where I would have had that freedom. So, I'm very, Cambridge provides an open space. 
uh, I would say. It's not too controlled, it doesn't have too much uh, direction, <laughs> yeah. if that isn't taken badly, <laughs> but um, it does provide an empty, uh, an open space, which is, which is very, very valuable. Which college are you at now? You're back at I've resigned. <laughs> resigned? Yes. So you're not at a college? I'm not at a college. I was at Downing College. Mm. I was at Churchill, but then mm. um, after I moved here, I resisted mm. joining a college. I didn't have time. Mm. And then I joined Downing. I mm. was a member of Downing for three years. Mm. They gave me a nice uh, fellowship. But in the end, I, uh, I decided I, I wasn't uh, bringing anything to them. I mean, I hardly went there. Mm. Um, and I think the college concept is in, in, in severe need of re renewal. Mm. <laughs> I think it's become stale mm. and um, it's no longer, a, at least some col the, co the colleges, I, I don't know many colleges, but the colleges which I do know, some of them are no longer, I would say, a kind of uh, genuine community of scholars. Mm. Um, they've become too, uh, too established, too, um, you know, less ambitious, um, and um, too many dinners. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mention that. I have my second one in the week uh, tonight. Um, you mentioned uh, your freedom to set up an institute in South Africa. Yeah. I heard a story, which um, you can tell me whether it's true or not, that when you came back, now quite well known, if not famous, to your home on one occasion, your parents said, that's all very well, Neil. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're doing some really great stuff theoretically. Yes. But we're going to lock you in your room <laughs> um, until you have an idea of what you might do usefully for South yes. Africa and then yes. they'll let you out again and you spent, yes. according to this story, quite a long time in there and then you yes. knocked on the door and said, I have an idea. <laughs> it's not quite true. It has a grain of truth. Mm. Uh, I went there, in fact Herbert Hubbard uh, helped me go there. I wrote to Herbert and I said, you know, my daughter is, I guess this would have been uh, five, five years old, I'd like her to spend some time with her grandparents. Uh, can I take a sabbatical? and go to Cape Town. Um, uh, so she has three months with her grandparents. So he wrote back and he said, um, uh, <laughs> he said, you've got to come up with a better argument than that. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, oh, well, okay. Uh, I'll go and discuss possible collaboration between the University of Cape Town and Cambridge. How about that? So he said, fine, I'll approve that. As, uh, chairman of the faculty board, and off you go. So I went to Cape Town, and um, my daughter went to the local school there, um, and I was working in a little flat on the Ekpyrotic universe. It was very wonderful. I had uh, complete uh, peace and quiet, and it was just excellent. Um, but uh, talking to my parents, uh, well, uh, the, the real thing is that I went to the university in order to fulfill this requirement that I establish a link with Cambridge. And I said, well, what could I do? And they said, we need maths. We need maths. South Africa has a strategic problem. We don't have enough students coming through with high-level math skills. What can you do? So we talked around it a little bit, and it very quickly emerged. There's the whole of Africa out there. There's got to be some good math students. Uh, let's bring them all to South Africa, which is a, a nice place to come. Bring the best international lecturers in the world, and um, we'll create some mathematical stars. Um, and uh, so, you know, it was it was just sort of obviously the right time to do it because South Africa is seen by everyone, respected by everyone, seen as a model for the future. So I had the idea after meeting with people at the University of Cape Town, I had the idea, well, we just need an African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, just like the Isaac Newton Institute mm. um, for Mathematical Sciences. And Ames sounds a lot better than I and I mm. as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I told my father about this, and we chatted about it a bit. He said, sounds great. I'm not sure we need mathematics. He didn't really get that part of it. But he said, <laughs> <laughs> sounds fine. Um, and then the next day there was a rugby match on the TV. 
And so I said, well, I'll come over to your house and watch rugby. He said, no, no, you, you, he said, that's okay, providing you spend an hour in my office and you produce one page on the African Institute of Mathematical, then you can watch rugby. <laughs> So, <laughs> so reluctantly I came over and indeed I spent an hour and I typed out this plan for a maths institute and I watched the rugby. Uh, next thing I knew, he's faxed this <laughs> to all the people he knew in higher education in South Africa. And, uh, and then I had to do it. <laughs> so, sheer uh, embarrassment. <laughs> so he really got the ball rolling. Uh, in a number of ways. He, he made me do it. Uh, he, he then, when I'd come back from South Africa to Cambridge, uh, he called me up and he said, there's a fantastic building on sale um, in Musenberg. Uh, it's 50 yards from the beach. It's an 80 room hotel, uh, Art Deco, built in the 1920s. Magnificent building. And uh, uh, you know, we have to buy it, and you have to set up this institute in this building. I said, wait a second, <laughs> I haven't got any money, <laughs> I haven't got any supporters, <laughs> I, you know, this is all a dream, you know. Um, and he said, no, let's go ahead and, and get this hotel. Um, and to cut a long story short, we bought the hotel um, for £65,000 for an 80-bedroom 80 hotel using um, an inheritance me and my brothers had. So my brothers allowed me to use this to buy the hotel. And then I brought the dean, the three deans of science from the local universities to the hotel and I brought them in I said, this is where we're going to form, we're going to set up the best maths institute in Africa. And one of those deans got very excited about this. The other two were supportive, but one was really enthusiastic. And he's now the director of the Institute and uh, so we converted this hotel and through you know a lot of hard work and good luck um, it has indeed become the, uh, a most amazing Institute. What a lovely story. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Was there anything else you wanted? Yes, to I wanted to ask just if I can just mm. put two more questions about yeah. Ames. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I just figured out what a wonderful name it is, Ames. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> um, uh, how is it doing now? What are the results mm. of... Uh, well, Ames is in its uh, fifth year. Mm -hmm. We've had four graduations. Uh, we've graduated about 160 students so far. Uh, they come from everywhere in Africa. So, uh, currently there are 53 students from 20 countries, uh, including 20 women. And we designed it so uh, to really be innovative. It has a, a very interesting program, which is quite unlike uh, normal postgraduate programs in universities. It's all geared towards problem solving and encouraging people to think for themselves and take initiatives and, uh, and so on. So it's been sort of designed with that in mind. Um, <clears throat> and the students have been incredibly successful. Uh, last year, I think, forget the precise numbers, but we had about 48 graduates and um, 45 of them are now on Masters and PhD programs in top institutions. One is a lecturer, one is doing an MBA, the other one's working in an IT company. Um, these students are the most highly motivated uh, individuals I've ever come across. <laughs> and <clears throat> given nine months at Ames, which uh, they use to the maximum. I mean, they work 16 hours a day, they learn computing and modeling, learn how to write, how to give presentations. Um, they take full advantage of it. Um, and uh, they become very successful. Um, and so <clears throat> I think we, we sort of stumbled on, a mo through, through necessity, and through not having enough money, we stumbled on a model of education which is extremely effective, mm -hmm. which is you get a bunch of people from many different backgrounds, countries, cultures, but with common intelligence. They are all very intelligent people. And you bring them together and you recruit the best teachers in the world 
who are all willing to come to teach the best students in Africa. I mean, everyone's interested in Africa. They all say yes. And they all live in this hotel. And so it is a 24-hour learning environment um, where people will be up until 2 a.m. every night having impromptu dis discussions, tutorials, um, and so on. So it's a terrifically uh, intense atmosphere. Um, and after nine months of that, these students are ready to go into anything. Uh, they can go into any field of science because they have all the skills that are needed. Uh, you see, the, this is what, uh, what happens in an old institution like Cambridge. <laughs> it develops layers of bureaucracy and rules and pro forma you know, uh, curricula, which are fi almost fixed in stone. Whereas a new institution, you know, can really jump to the cutting edge very quickly. And for me, that's, that uh, there's a sort of purity about what's done at Ames, which is uh, very exciting. That you think, you know, what do we actually want to do? You're constantly thinking, what do we want to do? What's the most exciting thing? You have almost total freedom um, to do that. And the goal is very simple. It's to create, you know able people who can go into any technical field and, uh, and contribute to it. Um, and uh, I mean the other thing is that by doing it in Africa you uh, automatically get students with very high motivation levels because this is the chance of a lifetime for them. So that itself creates a unique uh, atmosphere. So, so I think it, you know, even though you might have thought Africa would be the last place you would develop the best model of postgraduate education in the world. In fact, it's, it's been the best place to do it because you're taking students who are so keen. See, for, for African students coming out, of, you come out of the Congo, right? They are just as ambitious as we are. They, they want to be the next Einstein. You know, every, everyone wants that but they just had tantalizing tastes of it. And often quite good maths education at school, there are good maths, surprisingly good maths lecturers in the Congo. So these students come out and suddenly they're jumped to the cutting edge of science with the best lecturers. And boy, are they excited. <laughs> um, and creative, you know, they want to do things. Uh, we had a wonderful guy in the first year uh, who arrived from the Congo, and he, so he arrives, he says, say, what do you want to work on? He says, oh, I'm interested in quantum mechanics, I'm also interested in chaos, so I think I'm going to do quantum chaos. Okay, so he didn't know what it meant, uh, of course. <laughs> but he took a course on information theory at Ames, he took a course on quantum mechanics, and he wrote his essay using information, very sophisticated information theory, to understand quantum chaotic systems. And this was actually innovative at the time. And this guy as well, he writes poetry, he won a cookery prize <laughs> in the International Students Association, he spent his time in schools teaching kids. Uh, he's just a sort of renaissance uh, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he's an African. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the kind of students who we are finding. Um, and, and so my conception of Ames went from its being a sort of necessary step to solving a strategic problem, which is the lack of highly skilled people in Africa, more towards the conception that actually this will benefit science in the long run. Because I, I believe that when these cultures and uh, you know people from different backgrounds and cultures come into science, they all bring a, a new energy and freshness, enthusiasm, and very likely some new ways of looking at things. Um, and so I think this is a huge benefit to science. I mean, this year we have five uh, students from Ames in, a, in the maths department. Uh, previous to this week, you would essentially never see a black African in the maths department. Uh, and the ones you saw were very isolated um, and felt second rate and uh, alone. This year we've got five, and mm. it's just the beginning. Uh, I mean, and they, these students are on top of the world, and they're having a fantastic time. 
and I'm, I'm actually hopeful that one of them will come at or near the top in the financial maths course here. Very brilliant student. Um, and we've now set out, is now our culture attains, that we're going to prove something to the world, which is that black Africans are every bit as good at science as whites. And now it's become a matter of, uh, of principle. Mm -hmm. um, it, for example, you know, there was this ridiculous statement by Jim Watson. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you heard what happened subsequently. He, his genome was sequenced. And, and shown to be 16 percent Yes, that's African. right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we sort of use this story to egg the students on, and mm -hmm. they really take it on board. And one of our uh, sort of dreams at AIMS, which we repeat and which I, I will say at this TED meeting, is that our dream is that the next Einstein will be in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, the students love that. Mm -hmm. um, it's about self-respect. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about uh, seeing, you know, the opportunities in Africa, not just all the problems, mm -hmm. huge problems. But um, I think the world, you know, needs to change the way it looks at it. We, we don't want charity. We want, uh, you know, dynamism and energy. And, and Africa is so much to offer the world. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really the philosophy of the Thames uh, mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned TED conference, so my last question yeah. would be um, that uh, winning the TED prize means winning one hundred thousand dollars. But more importantly, you're granted a wish. Can yes. you tell us what your wish will be, or is it providing you don't publicize it no. before next Friday? <laughs> no, I won't. No possibility. So the wish has two parts. Uh, the first is the dream. Uh, the dream is the next Einstein will be in Africa. Um, and this dream may sound surprising or shocking. I mean, how could there be another Einstein? Um, and how could it possibly be an African? But if you think about it, it's not really that shocking. <laughs> Einstein was a Jew, and Jews didn't really get into science until uh, around 1880. Uh, they were actually prohibited from uh, going into universities in many countries in Europe in the 19th century. Uh, some Jews went into medicine, very few went into hard science. Um, but uh, once they got into it, <laughs> uh, starting in the late 1880s, uh, Hertz and uh, Jacobi were famous sort of physicists, mathematicians, then Einstein, Pauli, uh, Pauli um, uh, and, and, and then you know, Born, uh, huge numbers of them. Um, and so that over one quarter of all Nobel Prizes in Physics have been won by Jews, and uh, one quarter of the Fields Medals in Mathematics have been won by Jews. Um, so is that something innate to, to Jews? You know, I don't believe so. I, I think, yes, there's some elements of Jewish culture which are helpful. Um, a great respect for the written word, for study, uh, you know, which goes back to biblical times. But I think more important than that is that uh, they were out to prove something. I mean, that the Jews were a suppressed group of people. Uh, had suffered horrendous, you know, uh, discrimination and oppression. And when they got half a chance, they, they wanted to prove something about themselves. Um, now, look at Africa. Uh, culturally, possibly, you know, one of the richest continents on the planet. I mean, Half of our music comes from Africa. Art, design. I mean, anyone who tells me Africans don't have logical minds, you know, has never seen a bush mechanic in Africa fix a 50-year-old car. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or steam engines. There's still steamboats working in Africa. Why? Because they're incredibly clever, uh, ingenious mechanics. I've seen a guy fix a radio, a valve radio, used at the mission school, which I taught at in Lesotho. Completely untrained, but he kept that working, uh, and he understood it uh, in, in some way. I, I, I don't understand it, but he understood it. Um, there, there is genius all over Africa. I'm convinced of that. Uh, I've met some very bright kids. I was telling one story when I was teaching in. Uh, We've got two minutes. <laughs> uh, I was for, teaching for the wish as well. Okay. Oh, for the wish. I was teaching in Lesotho, and I took the kids outside for. 
to try to connect mathematics to the real world. And I said to, to them, okay, estimate the height of this building. And I thought they'd put a ruler and sort of, you know, five meters, something like that. So there's a little kid, and he's drawing on paving stones with chalk. I thought, oh, you know, he's completely misunderstood. What are you doing? You know, get the height of the building. He said, yeah, I'm doing the height of the building. He said, I measured the height of a brick, and I counted the number, and I'm multiplying them, and that's the height of the building. <laughs> well, that beat me. <laughs> so uh, I think genius is everywhere. And um, uh, that's the first part. The next item will be in action. This, the second part of the, the dream is a plan. Uh, we have a very concrete plan to replicate aims all over Africa. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get uh, major sponsors on board. Uh, there are indications that Bob Geldof will support it. Mm -hmm. I'm having a conference call with Price Waterhouse Cooper on Friday to try to get them to be the auditors mm -hmm. of this project so that the finances are kind of 100% uh, sorted out, management, training skills, I mean all of this. We want to do this properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, at TED this is what I'll be asking for. So we're looking for three corporate uh, donors who will give uh, all private donors who will give $50 million each and uh, that will set up an endowment fund which will fund student scholarships at AIMS and AIMS partner institutes all over Africa and then we'll go to governments. We already have the support of the African Union. They've already commissioned us to prepare this plan um, and so we have political support all over Africa. And we have partners all over Africa. We have sites in Nigeria, Ghana, Uganda, Sudan, uh, Madagascar, which we've visited. We have business plans. We're, we're, we're getting organized. And we want to do this properly. And I think when it's done, we'll have a network of aims. Um, and we'll be producing about, um, uh, well, we'll have we hope to have 15 centers after five years, each one producing 50 graduates per year. Um, and uh, those graduates will all go, uh, so some in actually academia, some into government, industry, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, we think they could have a major uh, impact in African development. So that, that's the future of, of AIMS.